I'm reading uh, from the Martyr's Mirror this morning, what we call the Martyr's Minute. I've got a real short excerpt. I read from this every every uh, week, and we've covered quite a bit of uh, church history. It only takes a minute to read, and it's about one of our brothers or sisters, or sometimes multiple people that were martyrs. Um, today we're reading about Mavilus. <laughs> in the year 201 A.D. Uh, Tertullian writes a very candid admonition and warning concerning the impending wrath of God over all the persecutors of Christians to Scapulus, the governor of Carthage, who having succeeded in the palace of Bidunius Saturnius, who on account of persecution had, he had exercised against the Christians, had been struck with blindness through the righteous judgment of God, also followed in his footsteps as regards, as regards cruelty. For at his ascension of the governorship, he immediately, very, he immediately, very cruelly sentenced Mavilus, a very pious Christian of Ardulum, a city in Africa, to be torn by the beast, who, though through a severe death, attained to a blessed end. Immediately after his death, great plagues were sent by the Lord over the city of Carthage, where the governor resided, as, as great rains, high floods, terrible thunders, fiery signs in the air, and so forth, took place. You may not have heard about um, this man, or you may not have even heard about the plagues and the and the judgments that came on this people for persecuting Christians. But let me say that God takes care of His own. And let me warn you that if you persecute Christians, you don't have to answer to me or my family or my father or my best friend. You have to answer to my God. This country is beginning to persecute Christians. Our neighbors, our family, our own family members begin to persecute us. They will have to answer to God. I don't have to have vengeance against them because God will have vengeance against them. There is a lot of persecution going on in a lot of countries of the world and those people have to answer to God. Those people will be judged by God and they will be punished by God for persecuting Christians who never laid a hand on simply for speaking the truth. Amen? <clears throat> now the message today is about making choices. <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice once again. <clears throat> it's like every every time I begin to speak, I get a Kermit. You ever had a Kermit? <clears throat> All right. Do what? Recording. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to begin in um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, if you would turn to Deuteronomy 30. Focusing on making choices today. That's what the message is about. That's what I want you to consider in your life. Have you ever thought about the choices that you make? From the time that you wake up to the time you go to sleep, and sometimes in the middle of the night you make choices, don't you? Some of your choices seem to be, for lack of a better word, benign. You know what I'm talking about? You know, what flavor ice cream do I want? What do I want for lunch? You know what I'm talking about? Should I buy this pair of socks or that pair of socks? Um, some of the choices that we make seem to be that they make no difference whatsoever in our life. And yet I beg the difference. I believe that you will find that every choice you make, every decision you make affects your life and I hope that you will see before this message is over, it affects your children and your grandchildren. Okay, today we're, we're looking at um, four different categories that you need to make choices in, four different things you need to um, decide to or choose to, to do. 
And the first one we find in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Now, before I read this, let me tell you the background of this. This is Moses speaking to God's people. God's people are here are the ones that were pulled out of Egypt and out of slavery. They were the ones that were in slavery, in bondage for 400 years. I want you to stop and think about that just a minute. These people were slaves for 400 years. See, slavery is a long-term um, plague on mankind, isn't it? It goes back to the beginning of time when man put, men put men in slavery, when they thought themselves better than someone else or different, they thought there was different classes of people. And here slaves were brought out of bondage and they were brought out toward the promised land by Moses through the power of God. Amen? So here is a people that have traveled in freedom, but they've traveled toward something. And as he presents this verse to them, or this statement to them, I want you to understand something, and that is that these people still had not had their minds liberated. Their bodies were emancipated and liberated, but their minds were still not liberated. Okay, so listen to this. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Now if you stop and think about the concept of that, you need to understand it is very strange to ask people who have been taken out of slavery this question. Really, think about it. They, they, were, they were set free through ten plagues, through the power of God. The, the Red Sea parted and opened up. They've got a pillar of of cloud during the day, they've got a pillar of fire by night that they're being led to. They've been given manna from heaven to eat. There's, it even says that the, uh, their sandals didn't wear out in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They had clothes that didn't wear out. They didn't have to make clothes. When they got thirsty, Moses struck a rock according to God's statement and, they, and water gushed out of the rock. I mean, these people were taken care of, weren't they? And yet, they had to make a choice. And yet, they had to make a decision. And they still had to choose God. You see, sometimes people raised up in church, raised up in Christian families, and they still don't choose God. They still do not make that choice. They may go through all the motions. Well, my family belongs to the so-and-so church, and I joined that church too. I'm a member down there at that church. My great granddaddy's name is on the end of that pew. So I must be going to heaven. I must be okay so I can do anything I want to do. Well, my mom and dad are good people, and they pray for me. I don't have to worry about my salvation. Pardon me? These people did, didn't they? These people certainly had to make a choice. Look at that again. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Well, that sounds pretty serious to me. That sounds pretty much like we need to pay attention to this. If heaven and earth are going to bear record against our statement. Sometimes we need to make a decision and we need to make it now. Instead of just lingering on, wishy-washy, every time we get in trouble, oh, I, I want to call out to God, oh, help me God, help me God, and as soon as you get out of your trial, you go back to living like the devil and for the devil. Isn't that the way people do? They call out to God because they know that he, that he has power and he will take care of them. And yes, they ran away from the Egyptians without hesitation, but they wanted it for free, didn't they? They wanted everything given to them. They wanted this newfound freedom to be, feed me, clothe me. I don't want to have to do anything anymore. Well, we worked for the Egyptians. Why should we want to work here? Well, I had all this fun, but at least we had the, the garlic. Remember when they said that? We had the garlic and the onions and the leeks. We had all this flavor back in Egypt. You know, we was under slavery, but we had a lot of fun. Had some pretty wild parties, those Egyptians worshiping their gods. And yet, God says, you're going to have to make a decision. I have set before you 
life and death, blessing and cursing. I do not understand why people will not choose life and choose blessing. See, this is not the, the, the free stuff. This that he's offering them is not come and take it like a lot of a lot of people are preaching today. You know it's free. Salvation's free. I beg to differ. Look at the cross. It's not free, is it? It was a high price that was paid for your salvation. And it's not free. And it's not cheap. And it requires your entire dedication and your entire life and totally focusing on him. And he said Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Here's a decision that I was talking about that because of your decision, your children, some of them unborn, your grandchildren unborn, your great-grandchildren unborn, your, your offspring will either suffer or be blessed because of your decision. That ought to shake you a little bit. Those of you who have never had children, it ought, to, it ought to shake you up that because of decisions you're making today, your great-grandchildren will suffer. And you say, well, I, I don't care. I don't, I don't even know if I'll even have children or not. What a terrible attitude. You know what? You have a lot of effect on people, whether it's your direct offspring or whether it's your siblings or whether it's your best friend or whether it's your co-worker or whoever it is that's influenced by you. I would hate to know that I led somebody to hell. I would hate to get to eternity and God said, you and this crowd of people here are going to hell because you in the front here made a decision and all these people followed you. So he said, you have to make a decision. Even though you've been pulled out of bondage, even though you've had the gospel, even though you've joined the church, even though you've done this and this and this and you've done things, You've never made the decision. So the first thing you need to do in your choices is you need to choose life. Now that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? You need to choose life. If I ask anybody in this room individually, anybody I walked up on the street, um, excuse me, would you like life or death? Well, life of course. Well, sure I want life. Are you willing to do what it takes? for life? Are you willing to do what it takes for life? Do you know that life, just in the life that we're thinking about on earth, this life requires work, doesn't it? You know, some of us go to work every day. I'll tell you, it gets harder and harder. It doesn't get easier when you wake up and the alarm clock goes off and you're laying there and you're thinking, another day out of 36,000 days I've gone to work. You know? Really, a lot of a lot of days you go to work and you think it's just this is hard. I, I don't find any joy, and I know this is going to be a, a tough day because I've got some things on my calendar that I'm not really looking forward to, and it's tough. And every day that you have life, you have to fight for it. So this life, spiritual life, is a daily walk with God, isn't it? It's a making my decision to go this direction and staying there and if you get off course you get back on course amen you can drift that's part of us we drift and then we get back on course look at um joshua 24 14. this is the next generation israel the next generation right joshua 24 14 and 15. Now, you know the story, after uh, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, all the original people had died off that rejected God and said that, there was, it was, that Canaan was too hard to go into. It was too hard in their mind because they thought they was going to do it on their own instead of just stepping out in faith and doing it. As God said, I will give you the power and I'll give you the way. They doubted God. They said, we need to go back to Egypt. It's too hard. Even though God had made a plan for them. So because of their unfaithfulness and their unbelief, they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. And so here's the next generation. Joshua is leading. Moses is gone. 
and Joshua is going over into Canaan. This is the end of the book of Joshua, the last chapter, and I'll tell you that they have already defeated all their enemies. Victory, oh, victory in Jesus, right? They have already defeated all their enemies, and yet he tells them something interesting here. Look in Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Serve ye the Lord. Well, I thought we was serving God. We're having church. I thought we was serving God. Look at verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me tell you something. It needs to be a household decision, doesn't it? And too many times households are broken up because somebody wants to go out and play in the world. Somebody wants to play with their friends. Somebody wants to go out and do what the devil wants them to do instead of doing what their family is doing. Too many godly families are being broken up today because of one individual. Isolation. And most of the time it just divides families. And Joshua here presents this, and that's amazing to me. If you think about that this is the next generation, the ones that should have been totally dedicated to God, they weren't born in slavery. They were the ones that were born in freedom with the promise of the promised land. With the promise of God. Seeing all the miracles. They lived through the they grew up with the manna. They grew up with all the miracles of God. They grew up seeing all this the power of God, the, the pillar of cloud the pillar of fire, all that stuff that was happening. The Ark of the Covenant that went before Moses that allowed them to defeat all their enemies before they ever crossed over Jordan. And they still had to make a decision. My friends, you have to make a decision for God. It can't be your dad's decision or your mom's decision or some best friend's decision. It has to be a personal decision. It has to be your decision. That is, that is the choice that you need to make of choosing life. Now, number two is you need to choose your friends wisely. And let's look at Proverbs 13.20 Proverbs 13.20 Proverbs 13.20 says He that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a, a companion of fools shall be destroyed he that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Now, let me ask you very frankly, what is your, what is what are your friends like? Are they are they godly people? Are they wise people? Are they people that you that will bring you closer to God? Are they people that will lead you astray? Who are your friends? Who are the people that you consider your friends? Who's your best friend? Is your best friend somebody that will bring you closer to God? If it's not somebody that will bring you closer to God, you need to find a new best friend or get or get rid of your friends. You need to find a good best friend or have no friends. Because you're better to have no friends than to have friends that will lead you to hell. And let me tell you this. You might be playing around in sin. You might be having. You might have some friends that will lead you astray, and you just you feel like, well, I've still got one foot in the church and one foot over here in the world, and you know I'm having fun while I'm young, and I'm going to do this, and you know I'm I still if I get if I get in trouble, I can still call on God. That's a very dangerous place to be in. And the truth is, would you be married to somebody like that? Would you stay married to a man or a woman who says, you know what, I still won't be married to you, but I won't, I won't flirt while I'm at the office, and I want to have some affairs, and I want to play around, because that's exactly what you're doing to God. 
if you think that you're going to stay in the church and then when you get and play around in the world you get in trouble you'll run back to the church you're just like an un, unfaithful spouse you're playing around in the world and it is very serious with God you need to you need to make sure you have friends that will bring you closer to God seriously what are your friends like well I'm just young and I'm just gonna have fun and you know my friends and me we just we like to have a good time we don't like to talk about religion we don't like to talk about God get you some new friends and get rid of those friends you need to find somebody mature enough that will be your friend your mentor and guess what God gave you parents God gave you mom and dad God gave you somebody that's more mature than you that can be your friend amen isn't that a great thing that we have somebody if we will accept that and too many times we don't too many times we turn the friends down that will be leading us astray because these friends seem to be having more fun over here but we turn them down look at it again he that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools what what does it say will be destroyed a companion of fools will be destroyed your friends have a great influence on your life as a youth pastor many years ago I spent see my fingers two hours with young people every week an hour on Wednesday night an hour on Sunday morning I was I taught Sunday school I did this for 10 years so in the 10 years time I saw teenagers come in at age 12 13 years old and go out in their 20s in 10 years time and every one of them unless they had outside influence for God fell away from the church did you hear me every one of them fell away I'm not saying that they didn't come back later but every one of them were led astray because they had friends at school friends in college boyfriends and girlfriends that led them astray your friends have a tremendous influence on you many of these kids their whole families were in church in my two hours of, of gospel during church service was not enough you see if you're pouring if you got a glass and you're pouring some purified water in here and there's some manure water over here on this side and you're putting in you know a cup of a cup of pure water and then a gallon of manure tea over here you've got garbage and you can read the Bible and you can be really devout during one hour a week, week at church service and then the rest of your hours of the week you can spend watching garbage on TV and hanging out with people that's leading you astray and you will end up in hell but I went every time the church doors was open God well that doesn't matter what about all those other hours you spend what about that music you listen to what about those friends that live and you will be in destruction look in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 1 Corinthians 15 1 Corinthians 15 33 and 34 Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Some have not the knowledge of God. That uh, verse is translated in some other translations of the Bible. Bad company corrupts good manners. Bad company evil communications is bad company bad company are you hanging around bad people bad company your friends your friends list are they the cool ones or are they the godly ones are they the popular ones or are they the ones that speak the truth because you know you can get popular if you tell people lies tell them what they want to hear <clears throat> always smile and just don't ever talk about religion or God or anything you can be real popular can't you 
Everybody will like you. That's what you want. Everybody will like you. And it's a good thing because you're going to be in hell with them. All those people that like you, they'll be right there with you. You need to choose your friends wisely. I have one more verse there. 2 Corinthians 6.14 while we're in this area. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. And, and it says unequally yoked because that's what it would be. It would be like a Doberman and a Chihuahua in the same harness. You know? A miniature horse and a, and a um, Percheron pitched up together in the same yoke. Can you imagine that? You know, the Percheron is a, is a stout, tall horse. I remember one that was at one of the sites I used to go to. I had to go through this farm to get to this radio tower I, I used to work at. And I always hated it because I had to go by this Percheron horse. And the owner was almost never there, so I had to... And he always thought I had to carry it for him or something. <laughs> you know, he, he, would, he would get up, his head would be right in my face. And that horse's back... I'm almost six foot tall. That horse's back was like this. It, it was a scary thing. His feet, you know, were that big around. If he had stepped on me, it would it would have broken my foot. But he was just like a big puppy. And that, that mighty horse, was, you know, he was very tame, but he would follow me around because he thought I had something for him to eat. And can you imagine a horse like that tied together with one of these little miniature horses? You know, I mean, it should be comical to you to think about but that thing would weigh down that mighty horse, wouldn't it? It would pull it down. And that's a strange thing about hanging around different people that are not the same maturity level as you or the same spiritual thinking as you, is they will pull you down. You think you're going to pull them up, they'll pull you down. As strong as you might be, they're going to weaken you. And yes, we do need to minister to them. I'm not talking about separating yourself all together. This is talking about being yoked together. What, what is the yoking? The yoking is something that you're in covenant with, you're in real deep friendship with. I'm not talking about your next door neighbors. I'm talking about somebody that is your very best friend. Somebody that, that you marry, somebody that you choose to go into business together with, whatever the covenant that you have with them in. Somebody that you join a church with. That's a serious relationship. And there are responsibilities, aren't there? So when you choose this, and you choose unequal, you're unequally yoked with someone, they will pull you down. They will pull you down. So you need to be very careful. And as a youth pastor, I saw that too. I saw young girls wanting to date boys that they, they were atheists. They were atheists. And it was it was like uh, well we're well at least I'll be able to preach the gospel to him. No no he'll lead you to hell because he's your he's going to be your husband he's going to be your head he's going to lead you and you're going to be led to hell. No 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 I'm I'm already saved and nothing can change that. And let me tell you it happened. Young girls marrying boys because they were cute and they didn't believe in God. Why would you want to do that? Young men going out with some girl because she's beautiful even though she doesn't care anything about God all her desire is is to get wealth get a big house and she sees you as her meal ticket and you're a man of God why would you marry a girl like that you need to make sure that you marry somebody that you're yoked together with somebody who is spiritual who will work with you amen that's what the yoking is for, is to work together to a common goal, is it not? How can you have a common goal if your goal is supposed to be heaven and theirs is hell? That sounds like opposite directions to me. Amen. And look in... Um, Psalms 119, 105. Psalms 119, 105.
Let's just look at verse 11 first, Psalm 119, 11. <clears throat> Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the third thing you need to make a choice in. Is you need to make a choice to study and hear the word of God. Make a choice to study and hear and follow the word of God. Now the word of God will never lead you astray. It will never give you a lie. It will never make you feel better by telling you a lie. It will tell you the truth. It will correct you. It will get you on the right course. And here the psalmist says, Your word, God, have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against you. Well, how do you, how do you walk around and not be in sin? Well, I'm just a Christian and Jesus' blood, just I'm just not in sin. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Read the Bible. That's not what it says. Just because Jesus, you just close your eyes and you say a little prayer and, you know, I'm just praying Jesus' blood on me and, and yeah, that, that gives you a new heart. But you've got to walk in the Word. Otherwise, what's the point of having this? Just throw it away. There's a lot of things in here to correct, is there not? So here he says, Your Word, O God, have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. Have you hidden God's Word in your heart? Is it the most precious thing for you to study? Or are you studying Harry Potter? Are you trying to find out what's the hairstyle that I need to have so I will look better? What kind of clothes do I need to be wearing that will accentuate my figure? Is that the kind of stuff you're studying? Are you studying the Word of God? Got quiet. You know, I, my, my skin tone, that I, I'm really a winter. And you know, I, I can't wear those colors. You know, we need to be thinking about eternal things and not the, the tone of your skin mm -hmm. and not what kind of makeup you need to be wearing and not what kind of falsities you can put onto the world that the world will like you a little better. Mm -hmm. You need to be thinking about your heart and people always throw this out. It's what's inside that counts. Isn't it, Brother Paul? Isn't it what's inside that counts? Yeah, why aren't you changing what's inside? I don't understand this concept. It's like a truck driver saying, you know truckers can't stop on a dime, and yet they ride right up on the back of somebody. What they say that for is they say it to their advantage when you pull out in front of them, and they're having to slow down. Well, you know trucks can't stop on a dime. Why do you pull out in front of me? And then, you know, they'll be six feet off of somebody's bumper going down the interstate. Well, you know, trucks can't stop on a dime. Yeah, it, it, that works both ways. Amen? So your word, God, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And now let's look at verse 105 of the same chapter. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, there's a whole message in that one verse. Your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, we've lost the concept of a lamp. Unless you go camping and you have a lantern, you don't understand that. You want a spotlight is what you want because that's the modern day of thinking. We have technology where we can have floodlights and spotlights and we can light football fields up, but that's not the way God's word works. He doesn't light up the football field. He lights up the path. Some of you need to listen to that again, so I'm going to say it again. He doesn't light up the football field. He lights only the path for your feet. Mm -hmm. Read it again. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word's not a football field set of lights. It lights step by step. And if you've ever camped, you understand the lantern concept. You hold it down at your side. There's a there's a uh, cowl over the top. And then all the light is toward your feet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Only a little bit out there. Only a few steps can you see. You can't see past that, can you? And that is the way the Word of God works. God, I want you to show me my life. I want you to show me how far. I want you to show me what, what's going to happen. He's not going to show you that. Don't ask for it. Don't waste your time thinking about it. God's Word will let you know what you need to do today. 
Did you hear me? God's Word will tell you right now. What do I need to do? Well, I think I need to be thinking about changing jobs, and I'm thinking about education, and I'm thinking about this. Good. Make the step today, because you don't know what there's going to be tomorrow. All through high school, I remember, you know, in my high school, I remember kids saying, why do we have to study algebra? What's this used for anyway? Why do we have to pay attention to science? I don't care how magnets work. I'm not going to be playing with magnets. Why do we have to learn about precipitation and how the weather changes? Why do we have to learn that? Why do we have to learn this? You know what? Your teacher has to give you a broad list of things because there are several of those things you're going to need heavily and all of those things you're going to need at some point. Amen? Well, what about a God that actually knows your path? He actually knows your direction. He knows exactly who you're going to marry, what your occupation is going to be, how many children you're going to have, where you're going to live, what kind of battles you're going to have in your health. He knows everything about your life, the pros and the cons. He knows everything about your life. And he says, Paul, I want you to go to school. Wow, I guess I'd better listen, hadn't I? Paul, I want you to separate yourself from this person. Paul, I want you to do this. And that's the step that the Word of God will say, do this. So you're wanting to know down the road, and instead of just obeying the God and obeying the Word of God in its simplest forms, you're wanting to know six miles down the road. He wants to show you the step that you need to take today and right now. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So that we need to listen to God's word. And the fourth thing we need to listen to is the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah 30, <coughs> 20 and 21. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And thine ears shall hear a, vo a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Now there's a whole new concept being taught in the church today is when God closes the door, he'll open an oath. Now that's partially true, but that's not scripture, is it? That's partially true that things happen sometimes to keep us from going somewhere. But I will say this. If you're focused on God, you won't have to worry about those doors. Amen. If you're focused on hearing the voice of God, this right here doesn't indicate keep going blindly until the door is just slammed in your face. Right. didn't say that, did it? No. It says, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. I will say that if you're playing that game that you're a child, you're, you're an infant, you're immature, if you're playing the game of, we're just going to keep going full speed ahead and, you know, God will shut the door. I don't want to walk like that. I want to walk step by step with the Holy Spirit saying, this is the way. The Holy Spirit saying, hold up, danger ahead. The Holy Spirit saying, turn right here, turn left here. I, would, I want the Holy Spirit to guide me. Now, I already covered about having the Word of God hidden in our hearts. The Holy Spirit will never tell you to do something that's against the Word of God. Never. And that's why it's important for you to learn the Word of God, and that's why I said that first. Because you know the Word of God, and you hear a voice saying, you need to go down and murder some abortion clinic doctors. You need to blow up some abortion clinics. That's not the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So if you know the Word of God, you'll be able to distinguish between the devil's voice and God's voice. 
If you don't know the Word of God, you're going to be real confused. Now, there was somebody told me many years ago, you can have three voices that you hear. You can have three things that you sense in your spirit. You can hear God, and you can hear the devil, and the devil would like to come as an angel of life, so he'll lead you astray. He'll lead you astray, and he'll sound like God right up to the end where you realize you made a, a mistake. But the other voice is your own. The other voice is just what you want. Your flesh. Well, I want this. I want it. It, it tastes good. It feels good. I, it make, that person makes me feel good. I feel good when I'm doing this. I'm happy about myself. I like myself. I'm going to find myself. It's all about me. And when that voice is leading you, you might as well have the devil leading you. You might as well be holding hands with the devil. In fact, you're saving him a lot of work when you do that because he knows your flesh will lead you astray. So if you're listening to your flesh, the devil doesn't even have to spend any time on you. You're just, you're just helping him out. Look at it again. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. Now let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 30. And this is the last one I'm going to touch today. Ephesians 4, verse 30. We was given the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to lead us and guide us, to help us to understand God's Word. And yet the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Ephesians 4.30 and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So can he be grieved? Yes. Have you ever been grieved before? I know your parents have. I know your parents have been grieved. I know you young people have been grieved. Have you ever had your feelings hurt? Have you ever had your heart broken? Amen when you work with somebody, when you love somebody and they don't love you back or they don't respect you or they don't listen to you, that is grieving to that person. And the Holy Spirit, if through the love of God, is there to guide you. He's there to bring back God's word to you. He's there to whisper in your spirit as a gentleman would. Paul, you're making a mistake. Paul, listen. Paul, listen to this. Amen. And little Polly says, You talking to me? Talk to me. That's right. And he wants to he wants us to follow him. And he wants us to be obedient to God, doesn't he? And what about if God spoke to you and you didn't listen? And you grieved him? What do you think would happen? Well, I'll tell you what happens. That voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter and less often. And less often. And I, sadly, I see so many people who used to be walking in faith. They, li they didn't listen to God. They got away from God. Little by little, they thought, I'm walking on my own now. I'm all by myself. Am I not doing well? Look at, look at how well I do without God. I didn't need God after all. That's just a crutch for me. I remember back when I was young and stupid and I did all that. And yet, they get in trouble and they say, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? Back in the early days of radios, radios had to be realigned every so often because the components would change. And if you open a radio back in the 60s and 70s that I remember working on radios, and even some of the old tube radios that were in wooden boxes, inside those radios were these little screws. I mean, they were all through it, and they actually technically were capacitors to retune the circuit. And I used to tune radios, two-way radios, and I was in the amateur radio or ham radio, and those things required periodic tuning. And if you let that thing drift off too far and get too far out of calibration, too far out of tune, you can turn the main dial and you wouldn't hear a word. You would not hear a radio station. You would not pick up anything. Television sets could be that way. Television sets would get all out of tune and you wouldn't get a picture. 
you know, God's that way. Th things start getting, the picture starts getting a little distorted, a little less clear. Your reception's getting a little worse. You don't pick up stations like you used to. You don't hear the Word of God like you used to. It, one time you could read the Bible and something every time you would read would jump out at you. And now you rarely, it rarely means anything to you. That's a danger zone. That's a dangerous place to be. You see, you've not allowed God to continue to lead you. You've not allowed the Word and the Holy Spirit to come out and guide you. And you've grieved the Holy Spirit. You've grieved Him. You've broken His heart. And you know what happens, children, when the parents tell you to do something and you don't listen? After a while, you're on your own. You're on your own. I'm sorry, you picked a, you picked a, as my dad used to say, a tough road to hoe. My dad used to say, son, you, you've got a tough road to hoe. You chose it, and now you've got to hoe it. That's the one you picked. I've known people that during their teen years, they were rebellious against mom and dad. Everything was mom and dad's fault. They got in trouble after trouble. They ended up in jail. They got bailed out of jail. They blamed Dad for that. You know, Dad, it's your fault I'm here. You don't love me enough. You don't care about me. You don't give me any freedom, whatever the stupid excuse was. And then they get in their 20s and they say, you know what? Dad was really watching out for me. And it may be too late. It might be too late to listen to Dad because you may end up where you've ruined your life. If you make the right choices day by day, the ripple effect will not affect your children. They will not affect your grandchildren. If you make a decision to move to a certain place, that's one of those that I talked about in the beginning that sounds benign. It sounds like if I move to this house, this is a better house for us. This house is two floors, got stairs. You know what? What if somebody falls down those stairs and breaks their leg and you hear God say, don't you remember when I told you not to buy that house? You come home and that house has got faulty wiring and your house is burned to the ground and you've lost everything you had. And, God, and you hear God say, I told you not to buy that house. You know, making decisions are very important, aren't they? And you need to make sure that every decision you make, if you think it's as silly as strawberry or chocolate ice cream, you need to make a decision. Is this the right thing to do? You go into the store and you're buying groceries and many people buy things because they just take it off the shelf. This tastes good. This looks good. I know we had this before. Well, you know, I saw a commercial about this and they're just buying things, putting it in the buggy. And you know who, who you can tell that's really wise? Somebody that takes that box and they read the back of it and they're looking at it and they're looking at the contents. That's somebody that's think, actually thinking about it. And I want you to read the contents. I want you to think about every decision you're making. I want you to see, is this really something that I need? Is this something that really will benefit me? Do I really need this? And there are a lot of important variables. I've given you these four main things in your decisions today, but there are a lot of things that you need to think about in your decisions. You get up in the morning and you get dressed. I hope. You get dressed, right? And I remember years ago when we started dressing plain and Angie said, I said, I said, you know, that woman probably doesn't even realize how ungodly she looks. She's wearing immoral clothes. She's wearing a real low-cut top and a real short skirt. And I said, that woman probably does not even realize you know, she, she thinks she's a Christian. She believes that that's a fine for her to look like that. And my wife said, no, honey. Women always dress a certain way on purpose. They, they meticulously get dressed for a reason. Remember that? I did, and it's true. They, they get dressed, they get up, and they say, this makes me look a little sexier, or this makes me look a little you know, younger or whatever, and they, they dress for a reason. They make a decision of what to wear. I gotta tell you, it's liberating to go to the closet 
and I've got black pants and I got white shirts or blue shirts. Uh -huh. Let's see, am I going to wear black pants? Well, wait a minute, I do have these green pants because she got green material cheap. You know, which one's clean? Which one's in the front? You know, and too many times we're spending, and I'm using it philosophically, but we're spending way too much time thinking about what we're going to wear today instead of, like, what are we going to accomplish today? You know, I remember the days when there's, like, one mirror and, like, seven faces in it. We'll look at how we're going to get our makeup on and how is my hair just right, you know? Have we got to, wait a minute, I'm missing my earrings, and wait a minute, you know? Where's the blow dryer? We need more blow dryers because, you know, we've got way too much hair to fix. And you know what I'm talking about? You know, it all sounds silly now, but at the time it was serious. It was our decisions that we made of our day-to-day -day walk instead of just making godly decisions. Just get dressed and get on with the serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Dress modestly, dress and cl fully clothe yourself, and quit trying to be sexy and let God handle your life. Amen. I'm running out of time, but I want you to seriously consider your choices. I want you to think about the choices that you've made. See, I'm, I'm in an age in life now where I can look back over my choices. And I say, you know, I, I almost went to this school. I was with Angie the other day, and I said, you know, I went to that school right there. This was a vocational school I went to. You know, I was thinking, that was a life decision. That changed my life because of going in and studying electronics. And I almost went to a, another technical school after high school, and that would have led me to another part of the state. And when I got out of tech school, I had four job offers, and one of them could have led me to Texas, and one of them could have led me to North Carolina, and one of them could have led me to Florida, and one of them could have led me to, to uh, Ontario, Canada. You know, I had all those choices of jobs. I ended up taking one in Birmingham. You know, decision after decision of my life, made a difference, didn't it? We moved here almost eight years ago. And because of it, you know, daughters found husbands. And it was an important decision. And we better make sure that we're making the right decision. I remember literally eating at certain restaurants, you know, and just thinking I nearly need, I won't be serious about where I'm thinking about and go in there and meet somebody and be able to pray with them and meet somebody that changed my life or changed some part of my life because I went to a restaurant. That's serious, isn't it? Don't you want your life to be led like that? Then you have to make, everybody's nodding their head, you have to make moment by moment decisions and think about it. Why am I doing this? Is it for the glory of God? Is this part of God's will in my life? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your word, giving us your Holy Spirit, giving us your will, Father. That we pro You promised that you would lead us, Father, if we would listen. The problem is we don't listen so many times. And I pray, Father, that today that we would be more in tune, more focused on your will and your word and your guidance, and that we will forget the things of this world, Lord, the, the time that we're spending on decisions that will not change our lives or that will lead our lives to the wrong place. I thank you, Father, for the friends that we have, Lord, that will lead us to the right place. And, Lord, it will, I ask that you help us to shun the friends that are not really our friends and they're not really going to lead us to you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>